Hello, hello. I hope you guys are all having a good evening. Um, this is my first time with the LSAT Unplugged group. And so my understanding, Steve, is that you guys have a, a, several of these sessions, maybe a month where you're learning sort of LSAT tactics and then also maybe areas um, a little bit outside of that. So um, I hope that this is really helpful for you guys, just so that I get a sense for uh, where you guys are in the LSAT law school lawyering process. For those of you who are studying right now for to apply to the 2022 cycle, can you drop 2022 in the chat? And for those of you guys who are have already taken the LSAT or maybe retaking it and applying for the 2021 cycle, drop 2021 in the chat, just so I can get a sense for kind of where you guys are in the process. And right, also, I'm going to say, uh, Angela, my name is Solomon. I'm a TA, so let me know. Uh, oh, here. you're going to, oh, great. And if you need to introduce yourself. So, uh, oh, you perfect. Know, just, just wanted to let you know, but if you're good, let me know. I can introduce you or if you can start off however well, just go ahead. So, yeah. Oh, no worries. Yeah, no, I just got a, I just got a tip to, to go ahead. So I jumped in. Sorry about that. <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. I'll just introduce you real quick so you can be on your way. So everyone, oh, this is uh, attorney Angela. I apologize for uh, boxing. Is it Borfa? Vorpal, very close. Oh, okay, Vorpal. <laughs> um, so she uh, actually graduated summa cum laude from South Methodist University um, um, in uh, Dallas, Texas, and she now focuses on um, law school prep. And today she's going to be talking about why law school is different in undergrad and how cha how that changes everything. So uh, yeah, you can go ahead, Angela. Awesome, Solomon. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I just had asked a, a couple of you guys to drop in the chat kind of where you are in the process. And it looks like you guys are 2022 cycles. So you're really, really on, which is fantastic. And um, I'm so excited for you guys to, to go through this, this whole process. Um, as Solomon said, I am a law school coach. And so I help law students develop the strategies to do well in law school to help streamline processes to compete for top grades and help position them for their dream job out of law school. And so it has been so much fun um, working with, with law students to really get the most out of law school and out of their investment. And so I know that this is coming pretty early for some of you if, if you're kind of about a year out, but I think it's important to start thinking about how law school is different and a little bit of what to expect so that you can kind of alter your mindset around how you're going to jump in and, and kind of tackle this. And so if you guys are willing, I'd love for you to drop in the chat kind of scale of one to 10, how you feel about law school right now. So one being like totally terrified and five being like kind of nervous or unsure. And then 10, just being over the moon, excited, like could not be, um, could, could not, could not be more thrilled <laughs> to like, start law school. I'm just, I'm just curious. I think for me, when I was starting out, I was probably about, yeah, like, a, like, I don't know, a 6.5, 7.5. Okay. Five, four, like a little bit more on the nervous side. Yeah. And I think that it comes a lot from just, just unknown, like a lack of information about what law school is and what it looks like and how to do well. And so that's what I focus all, a lot of my work on is really trying to help fill in those gaps so that you know what to expect and you know what those strategies look like. So it's not just kind of this black box of information. And so in our talk today, I know we're focused on why law school is different than undergrad and, and how that makes all the difference in the world. And if you guys have questions, I'm incredibly happy to take those at the end. So feel free to just drop them in the chat box as they occur to you. And then we'll have a Q&A session at the end as well. So I think the most helpful place to start with respect to this conversation about, about law school and how it's different than other academic experiences is to look at what our academic experiences have been to this point and how that perspective has really informed how we view law school. I think that's really important because for most of us heading into law school, our academic experiences have been really positive and have been really, um, really successful. And so a lot of law students heading in have done really well in undergrad or grad programs, really well in high school, 
most of the time that's come easy to people. Um, there's also this, um, I get this a lot from students that I was able to get good grades. and I didn't really have to work that hard. Um, a lot of people will cram for exams and things like that. And so what tends to happen is that the, the perspective of law school is why would that be any different? So I've always been, I've always been able to, to hit or exceed my grade goals. I don't have any evidence or reason to believe that that won't be the same in law school. And so that um, is absolutely how I felt heading into law school too, is, you know, why would this be any different than anything else? And I think that those expectations and assumptions are really important to recognize that we have them and also um, to really break them down for what they are, because the statistic is something like 80% of law students think they're going to be in the top half of their class and 50% of law students think they're going to be in the top 10%. And mathematically, that's impossible, of course, but it's really important to, to recognize where that's coming from. And also that that's kind of our mentality heading in so that we can challenge those beliefs and kind of understand, um, understand what we need in order to really make that possible. And so the first thing that is important to recognize um, the difference between law school and undergrad are the pool of people that are going to be your classmates. Because for a lot of us, um, our experiences of being at the top of the class and A's coming easily to us and, and not really having to work that hard, we have been in, uh, in a pool of people that have had different a variety of academic goals, right? So it kind of has run the gamut of um, whatever those goals aspirations, work ethic, motivations, everybody is kind of in their own boat in terms of how important school is to them. But when you get into law school, that pool becomes much more of a self-selected minority of people who are highly motivated, incredibly hardworking, very goal-oriented, very grades-oriented. And so the, the people that are your classmates and that are surrounding you are necessarily going to become this subsection that is much more that is much more competitive and, and much more academically focused. And the reason that that is so important is because of the next big difference between law school and undergrad, which is how law school is graded. And in undergrad, there is no limit on high grades, right? So you everybody hypothetically could score between a 90 and 100 on, a, on an exam and get an A. Um, there's no quotas that have to be met, but in law school, it grading is completely different. So you may have heard this before, but law school is graded on a curve and every law school does this a little bit differently, but essentially professors are required to assign a certain number of A's, a certain number of B's, C's, D's, F's. And so it tends to take the shape of a bell curve where the majority of the class is focused in the middle um, at the B range. So majority of the people in your class are going to get Bs, a very small percentage are going to get A's and A minuses, and a very small percentage are going to get C's and F's. And the reason, of course, that that's important and that, that really implicates the people that are in your class is because you are going to be directly competing against other people in your class because Again, every law school does this a little bit differently, whether it's a median GPA or a set number of, of letter grades that have to be hit. You are generally going to see in a class of 100, maybe five A's, maybe 10 A minuses. And so those are really, really, really small percentages of people who are breaking out of that B pack and getting into the A pack. And so that alone is what makes law school so incredibly competitive. And that may be. Um, some of the, the horror stories you've heard that are not entirely true, but of people like ripping pages out of books in libraries and like stealing computers and, and stealing notes and things like that um, to try to get an edge because of the idea that, that law school is so competitive. And that, that stuff like very rarely happens, but the underlying sort of, of, of drive of that is that yes, law school is incredibly competitive and you're competing against very capable, very highly motivated people. And so that is one of the one of the biggest differences and one of the things to keep in mind as we as we go through this. Now, one of the things that I do want to address kind of before we go a little bit deeper into this, um, a little bit of, of an elephant in the room is that every single law student, every single lawyer has gotten a grade in law school that they are disappointed by. Absolutely, it has happened. In, 
even for those of us who are, you know, straight A students from kindergarten have never seen a B in our life, it is inevitable that you will get a grade that you are not expecting and that you are not incredibly happy with. I have talked to um, motivated, intelligent, hardworking lawyers who've gotten their first C in law school, that have gotten their first D in law school, and certainly have gotten their first share of Bs. And so I tell you that not to change your grade goals or change your motivation around what it is you want to accomplish in law school, but just to give you that sense of deference and respect for how difficult this really is and how incredibly capable the people around you are. Um, and I think that that's helpful to have that sort of healthy level of, of, um, of, of fear or of, of understanding that this is a lot of work, especially if your goal is to get to the top of your class, that this is something that is going to take more effort and more strategy than, than what you probably put into undergrad or grad school um, or your other academic experiences. I also bring this up because the truth of the matter is because of the curve that 90% of law students are not going to be in the top 10% of their class. So mathematically, that is how it's going to play out every day from now until um, that curve no longer exists, which in, in, our, in our system, it has existed for a very long time. And so I don't want you to think that if you are not in the top 10% of your us, that that means that you are not smart, that it means you're not hardworking, that it means you're not going to be a successful lawyer or have a successful legal career. That's not what it means at all. I tell you this because there are a lot of lawyers out there that did not do particularly well in law school, that have incredibly amazing careers that they love, that they're passionate about and very fulfilled by. The other side of that coin, however, is that you are spending a ton of money, a ton of time, you're investing a ton of your life into this degree. And as long as you're going to go through the process and put in the long hours and spend those long nights, as long as you're going to do all those things anyway, we may as well go all in and leave everything on the field and do as well as you possibly can, because there's no, there's no reason not to. Um, as long as you are going to do this thing, as powerful as these grades are, which we'll talk about a little bit later, you may as well go, go for it. And so that is, I think, something that is really important to keep in the back of your mind in terms of how you approach grades, um, what sort of what this system is of who, who you'll be speaking or who you'll be competing with and how and how much effort it's really going to take to be able to compete at these very, very high levels of your class. So let's dive in a little bit in terms of what you can expect from law school and how that's different than undergrad. And the first way that uh, the content is going to be different is the way that the information is presented. So in undergrad, everything, I, I say this as generally speaking, right? Most courses, most majors, there's a direct through line with what you are taught and what you are graded on on the exam. And so you are generally assigned to read pages in a textbook. You have class lectures, PowerPoint presentations. There's no hide the ball tactics. It's very much, here's the information you need to learn. And then the questions on the exam are asking you about that information that you were just told to learn. So in law school, <laughs> in law school, the information that you need to learn is the law, right? Which makes total sense. It's the rules of law, but the way the information is presented is anything but direct and straightforward. So the things that you will be reading to help teach you these rules of law are, is not just a textbook saying, this is the rule for how property gets transferred, or this is the rule or when somebody um, is, uh, is liable for assault. Instead, the way that you're going to be learning these rules, the way that the information is presented is through a case book. So you are going to be reading cases in order to learn these rules of law. And a case is, we call them cases, but what they really are are judicial opinions in previous legal disputes. So litigation, someone has sued someone else, and the judge has been asked to give a analysis and a, and a holding on a rule of law. And so what's super interesting about this is that even though the, the goal of the case is to teach you this rule of law, it is reading a case to learn a rule of law is the most convoluted way to actually learn what that, what that rule is. And so it 
real time what that looks like is you may be assigned a 45 page case, incredibly dense material, legalese, um, very circuitous reasoning to teach you um, that the, the, the standard of care is that of a reasonable person. And the kind of one-two punch of how, the, how this information is presented in law school is that you have this, you have the reading part of it, which is, which are these cases, which are not telling you exactly what the, what the law is. It's, it's sort of asking you to figure it out for yourself. Then you have lectures, which is the other part of teaching you the law and professors will at least, at least at the beginning of class start out, not also not telling you what the rule of law is. And so the way that a lot of lectures are, are traditionally presented in law school is through the Socratic method. And so you guys may have heard this term before, and it's very much what you would think of based on the way that Socrates taught, which is this dialogue between a professor and a student, questions and answers, where the professor is basically poking holes in, in whatever it is you're saying and your explanation of the rules and in your analysis of, of a particular fact pattern to try to get you to see that there are the strengths or the weaknesses of an argument or get you to question why we have the rule we have or how you think through it. And so the, the reason that the Socratic method is so popular and it has sort of ruled the classroom for so many years is that law schools believe that they are designed to teach us how to think like a lawyer. So they're designed to get us to look at a set of facts and not only drill down on what the most important facts are, but also be able to see the outcome from different perspectives, be able to see how to argue it from one side and from the other side. And so that's what law school is designed to teach us. And so that's how professors tend to operate in their classrooms. Now, the reason that this is really tough and very different from how undergrad is structured is because you are still required and you are still going to need to learn the rules of law when you think about it, you're not getting them directly from the cases. And a lot of times you're not getting them directly from the professor either. And so you have to go and find ways to directly understand what these rules of law are and then how they apply in certain factual scenarios. So one of the biggest complaints um, about law school is that it's it, it has an approach of hiding the ball, meaning you, you don't really know what the rule is. You don't really know the informa what their information is, and it's up to you to figure it out and to, and to find it. Now, some professors, I would say the majority of professors, the other half of their lecture, the other part of their lecture is going to help you walk through the information. But for some professors, they're very, very upfront about the fact that it is not their job to teach you the law. It is their job to help you think like a lawyer in quotes. And it's your job to go outside of the classroom and, and teach yourself the law, which is really crazy. And one of the big, um, I would say a, a really uh, big complaint of a lot of, a lot of lawyers and, and law students about how the system is, is created. Okay. So the next piece to this puzzle, how it's, how it's different is you have the way that the information is presented, but then you also have it also informs how these law school exams are structured. And so in undergrad, again, like there's that direct through line of what you're taught. So what you read, what you're taught in lectures, what, if you have homework, what that homework is designed to teach you, and then the exam, what you're required to sort of recite or pair it back or regurgitate. And it's a very, very clear, clear line connecting one to the other. In law school, it very, very much is not a clear line between what it is you're taught and and what and how you're going to be tested on the exam. And so in law school, you're never going to have an exam that asks you a question like, what are the four elements of negligence? Or in what year was Plessy versus Ferguson decided? Or what is the holding of the Lucy versus Zemmer case? It's never going to be something that's sort of just recitation or parroting back. Instead, the way that a law school exam is structured is all about application. And so you are going to require to take these rules of law that you learn throughout the semester and the examples of how those rules have been put into practice through cases. And you are going to be asked to apply them to a hypothetical factual scenario, which is going to be on the exam. And so these types of exams are known as issue spotters, and they are the most prevalent type of exam in law school, especially your 1L year. And so the what's interesting is that 
the, the rules of law that you are going to be expected to learn from these cases, from the lectures, and then from outside sources that help you sort of piece these things together is that you need to know the rules of law, but that's sufficient. It's, um, what is it required, but not sufficient necessary, but not sufficient. You also need to develop the skill and develop the, the, um, muscle to be able to apply those facts to uh, th those rules to a factual scenario. And so I know that this isn't a how to take a final exam course. That would be that would be much more extensive. But the thing I do want to want you guys to understand, the most important takeaway is that for final exams, we're never looking for the right answer. I think it's really, really hard for us to wrap our heads around. And I see this being one of the, the biggest struggles for new law students is that we are so programmed to find the right answer, whether that's algebra, algebra or physics or history. Um, it's, we have always been taught that there's a right answer and, and all we need to do is find it and then, and then recite it back and that gets us top grades. In law school, the thing to start thinking about and to start wrapping your head around is that there is no right answer. There are only good arguments. And so this whole idea of thinking like a lawyer is designed to help you see how to attack um, or approach a dispute from multiple angles. And so on a law school final exam, like we said, you're never going to be asked to cite facts or rules. You are going to be asked in an, in an indirect way, of course, to be able to argue a dispute from one side and argue a dispute from the other side. And so that's something that's really important um, in terms of mentality and approach to law school is understanding that not only is the information presented very differently, but the way that the structure of the exam, the way that you're going to be tested is, is also very, very different. That takes us to the next big difference between undergrad and law school, which is how you study. Because if we're gonna have these crazy exams that are totally different uh, from undergrad, the next question becomes, how do we prepare for them at all, right? And so in undergrad, um, I think for the most part, a lot of us didn't have sort of a well thought out study strategy. Um, we did the reading, maybe. We took class notes, maybe. We did the homework, maybe. And then we really turned up the intensity when there was a midterm or an exam or a paper or a presentation, like something, something big and graded, right, that was coming up. And that's when we sort of put pedal to metal and accelerated um, our our energy and what we kind of, how we applied ourselves. And we were able to do that. And, you know, I hear this from a lot of, a lot of students as well, um, and able to cram for exams at the last minute and, and, and really still kind of put in that last, that last ditch effort and still get A's and still do really well. Um, in part, that was because again, the way that it's structured is very straightforward memorization and so if you were good at cramming, if you were good at um, sort of internalizing a lot of information really quickly, you could still get A's in a very short amount of time. The other reason that it was possible is because there was no max number of A's. So if you remember the information and you recited it, you could still get an A, even if every other person in that class also got an A. And the other reason that that was possible for us in undergrad is because we were being tested on smaller chunks of, of information. So we were required to retain less information and we were required to retain it for less time. And so maybe you were tested like every four weeks or every six weeks or even every eight weeks. And that was still very, very possible to internalize. And because you had all of these different um, opportunities to be graded, you could blow one exam or blow a quiz and still wind up getting an A in that class. And that's really important to understand because law school is completely different. The way that you're tested and the way that the final exam is structured and weighted is very different. So most law schools across the country will have one final exam at the end of the semester that's 100% of your grade are law schools that are starting to have midterms and break down the grade into, into quizzes or participation, but still, at least right now, a lot of those are either not graded or they're like a very, very minimal part of your grade, something in the range of like three to 5%. So very negligible. And so what that means is that 
for one exam that's 100% of your grade at the end of the semester, those four months of studying and reading and late nights and organization of the material comes down to one three to four hour exam, which is crazy stressful um, and a really, really tough, uh, makes for a really, really tough two week period to, to, really, to really go all in. And this means a couple of things, right? So big difference with, with undergrad, but in terms of how that plays itself out is that you are going to be expected to have learned four months of information as opposed to maybe six weeks of information in undergrad. You're not going to get another chance, another bite at the apple. This is like a one and done thing. This is 100% of your grade. And as we talked about, the exam isn't memorization-based, it's application-based. And so it's not enough to just know the rules. You also have to know how to apply them. And so the biggest takeaway here is that you cannot study in law school the same way you studied in undergrad and, and expect the same results. It's, it's just not going to be possible because of the structure and the format of, of the courses and of, of the exams themselves. And a, what that sort of translates into in the in the day to day is that you can't rely on short term memorization and regurgitation and you can't cram for final exams at the very end of the semester it's just not going to leave you enough time to be able to internalize uh, all this information and learn how to apply it and so the, a really big takeaway for that is instead of a cram at the end type mentality, the absolute best way to approach law school is a semester long study strategy where you are literally starting to prepare for exams from day one of law school. Okay. That's really, that's a really, really important takeaway, a really, really important difference. Um, and I think something that sort of plays into that kind of the second part of that too, is to understand that the other piece that makes law school really difficult is just the straight up workload. The amount of information that you are being taught and fed and required to know on a, on a daily basis and on a weekly basis. Because I would say that in undergrad, and I think this is pretty similar across the board, the work is manageable. So there, it is physically possible to read everything you're assigned in, in class and, and take notes in class and review all of those the exam like that is physically possible to do in law school it's not there will always be more information and more ways to to learn and practice that information than there are hours in the day and so the thing that is so tough is that from day one you in law school you're absolutely inundated with information you are going to have about on average about a hundred pages of reading a day and that keeps going. It's fast and it's furious and it's constant. And you're learning new information all the way up until the last day of class, which tends to be about a week before your first final. So there's just no way that you could wait until the end of the semester, try to learn four months of information in, in a matter of days. Um, and so we just, yeah, so we just don't have the luxury of, of, of waiting and cramming. It has to be, the study process has to be this ongoing process that you are chipping away at and taking steps toward every day, every week of the semester, starting from day one. And what I would say absolutely is the key to success is learning how to manage the workload. Because if you fall behind, it is virtually impossible to catch back up. There's just too much information that is coming at you too quickly um, to allow yourself to, to fall behind and then, and then try to double up triple up or quadruple up the amount of work you're in your day to day to, to prepare for final exams. And the key to keeping up with that workload is knowing what to spend your time on and, and when to spend that time. And so those things really, really go together because as I said before, there's, there's no way to do all of the things. And so you have to get really clear and really st strategic about what you're spending your time on, what that, those things look like, when to focus on them and, and what to actually focus on. And I know this really sucks to hear because if I had said this to past me heading into law school, I think I would have been a bit heartbroken, but in law school, if your goal is to get to the top of your class, straight up hard work, isn't going to be enough. You cannot white knuckle your way through law school, meaning just do all the things and like 
hunker her down and stay up till 4 a.m. reading all the things and studying all the things, it's going to be too much. You need to also be strategic about what it is that you're doing and, and how you're doing it in order to, to position yourself by the time that law, uh, law school finals come around to be able to perform at a high level. So that's another big, big difference between undergrad and law school. Then I would say, we're talking a lot about grades. We're talking a lot about the, the importance of grades and, and how you go about really strategically managing grades. And the reason that this is so important and the reason that a lot of what I'm talking about today, exclusively what I'm talking about today is grades oriented is because your grades in law school are incredibly powerful. Legal industry is very, very grades obsessed. It is very, very grade centric. And every legal employer will look at your grades before they will look at any other part of your application. And this is particular, particularly relevant for 1L because your 1L year grades are going to be disproportionately powerful to any other grades that you have in law school. And the reason that that is the case is because the most extensive hiring process in law school happens at the end of your 1L summer, beginning of your 2L year. You guys may have heard of this process. It's called OCI or on-campus interviewing. Some law schools call it EIP, early interview program. And that happens very early on in the process, 1L, end of 1L summer, beginning of 2L year. And as we just said, law firms and legal employers are going to be the most influenced by your grades. And the only grades you have at that point are your 1L grades. And so those first year grades become your ticket into a lot of these opportunities and a lot of these doors opening for you. And so the thing to know about this OCI process or this hiring process is that it's very, very competitive. And so it depends on what law school you go to as to how high you have to rank in your law school class in order to participate. But, but just to give you a, a rough idea, if you're going to a T14 law school, they generally will want to see you in the top half. Um, as you go kind of down the rankings into more regional schools, we're looking at top third, top quarter, or top 10% to really have all of these opportunities open to you and, and have, and have you be able to to compete for these interviews. And so I would sort of kind of to put this in perspective, if, if in undergrad, it worked the same way and your freshman year grades determined whether or not you could apply to your dream job out of college, of course you would put a ton of energy, a ton of effort, um, and a ton of time into really, really getting those grades as high as possible. And so that is that is why you'll hear such an emphasis on your first year and kind of hand in hand with that. It, your first year is also your most difficult because everything you're learning, you're learning for the first time. It's brand new. There's a huge learning curve. And so not only is it the most difficult, it's also the most stressful because you know that it is um, not only competitive, but, but has the opportunity to open you up to these um, really prestigious, really high paying jobs. And so one of the things that I, that I always talk with my students about is kind of what we did at the beginning of this talk, which is, no, you do not need to have the highest grades in order to have a successful career in the law. But I want to give every student I work with that ability and, and the steps and strategies in order to do that so that you can decide what jobs you want and, and how you want your career to look. And you have control over those decisions rather than the market or the legal employer dictating that for you. And so that's why we put such an emphasis on grades. That's why we put such an emphasis on the study process, not only because it is very foreign and very different to what we're used to, also because it makes a really, really big difference in terms of the opportunities available to you. So let me check out the chat and, and see if anybody has any questions. I'm happy to ask. Uh, I'm, happy, I'm happy to answer anything that you guys would like to know. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. And, um, and I, hope, I hope this was helpful. I hope you guys were able to take something away. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you, Angela. Um, did you prefer the questions? Did you prefer me ask or did you want people to ask through the chat? What's easier for you or? Either, either way, you guys can drop something in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, either way, I'm, I'm available. 
Okay, cool. I'll just kind of start it off. And then if anyone has a question, like she said, you can drop it in there. If you're too timid, you can just um, kind of funnel it through me. Um, no, this is really helpful. I appreciate you um, uh, sort of going through this. Um, one thing I always try to ask, uh, I guess lawyers are, hey, how do you prepare for law school? And the answer is always, you can't really prepare for law school. Um, yeah. So I, I was curious, as I know, um, and I'm pretty sure um, you've heard of the IRAC method, right? Like the issues, the rules, analysis, conclusion, all that stuff. Um, I guess I was curious because um, since it is graded on the curve, so assuming that I guess students are able to address each of those things um, in the IRAC, what would you say separates the 10% the of students from the 50%? So the top 10% from the 50% in terms of how they're addressing those issues on the examination? Yes, really, really good question. So the, and just to kind of loop everybody in. So the most traditional way to approach a final exam answer for one of these issue spotter exams where you have a fact pattern and you have to spot the issue, um, identify the legal rule, and then analyze that legal rule as it applies to the fact is the IRAC method, which stands for issue rule um, application or, or um, analysis conclusion. And I love that method. Like I think that the reason I like it, it's simple and it's direct. And so you can keep it in your mind as you're going through these, these exams, which are crazy fast races, like three to four hours just flies by. Um, and so having that framework in your mind is fantastic. The thing to keep in mind that separates sort of like to break out of the B pack, right? So to separate you from the median um, is that everybody will get the biggest issues. And so in these fact patterns, they're intentionally ambiguous. They're intentionally um, in that gray area where there is no right answer. And so what tends to happen is that a lot of law students will go into the exam thinking, what is the right answer? And so if you have a fact pattern for civil procedure, for example, you'll start reading the fact pattern and you're like, I see it. I, that's definitely personal jurisdiction um, or that you know venue definitely exists. And so they'll write their answer with they'll write their answer with the right answer in mind. So they'll identify the strongest arguments. Um, they'll identify the strongest facts that back up what they think that answer is. Unfortunately, even though that's a great start, most everybody will get those big issues and most everybody will get those big arguments. The way that you start moving up the chain to from B to B plus to A minus to A is identifying the counter arguments. And so what a lot of people, either, either they've heard it either they haven't heard that it that you need to address arguments and counter arguments, or they've heard it, but they don't really understand how to do that. Um, they'll leave so many points on the table because when a professor is grading school exams, they usually do it by a rubric and they're, and they have kind of, you know, maybe a, a, an Excel spreadsheet saying like, here's all the issues that I, that I put in the fact pattern. Here are the facts that people can argue. Here are the arguments and counter arguments. And so a lot of people get the big stuff, but very few get the more nuanced issues, the counter arguments. Um, and so what I would say is that to start moving yourself up the chain, you have to adopt this mentality of argument, counter argument. You have to adopt this mentality of no right answer. Because if you don't, you'll just be leaving all of these beautiful points on the table for these facts that can be argued one way and the other way um, that can you can see it from the perspective of the plaintiff and the defendant and so that is the biggest thing that students struggle with and the and the biggest reason that they have that they struggle to to move out of the b pack and, and up the chain to a's wow thank you so much for that um and one of our future lawyers asked um are there any techniques in uh, note taking in the note taking process as we first trans transition into law school so many. Yeah, yeah, so many. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, so yes, the answer is yes. Huh? Oh, I thought there was a question. Okay, so the short answer is yes. There are, I have so many um, approaches to note taking that is really, really, um, really, really helpful and kind of in stream process and helps you focus on the things you need to focus on. The, the number one thing I would say is that most law students get in the reading. So when you're talking about 100 to 150 pages of cases that you have to get through every day, it is an insane amount of work. Um, you also, because of the way that these cases are written, they're not super straightforward. They're not light reading. Like they're very dense. They're, they're, they're very confusing. And so a lot of, a lot of us will we need to read it two to three times just to understand what is going on. And so th that number starts getting doubled and tripled. Um, and so what I 
always, always recommend is before you sit down to read this 15, 30, 45 page case to always know what the case is about before reading it. And so the easiest way, because as we talked about, the cases are designed to teach you a rule of law. Like they're there for a reason, but the, the reason that law school is so the presentation of the information is so difficult is because there, when you read a case, it's sort of like, Hey, you figure out what that rule of law is. You figure out why we're, why we're assigning you this case and what it, what it's meaning to teach you. And so to bypass that in, 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 in huge time investment and that confusion is to figure out what the big takeaways of the case are before you start reading it. And the best way to do that is to read a case brief summary before you actually read the case. And the most popular right now are Lexis and Quimby. And so essentially what you're doing is, is finding the golden egg. Like you find the answer before you invest three hours in reading a case so that you know what to look for, you know what the big takeaways are. And then as you read the case itself, it's so much easier to identify the facts that are important, the rule that's important, the analysis that's important, the holding that's important, because you already know what the game is. Like you already know what that answer is. And so that's number one thing I would say about, about, about time management and, and, and note-taking is, is you have to do yourself that favor. Otherwise you're going to fall into this well of reading and reading and rereading and, and 150 pages a night. And, and you will never actually move on to um, any other, any other steps of the study process that you need to prepare for finally. Awesome. And they said, thank you for your answer. Um, you mentioned Lexis and Quimby. Could you spell it? Quimby is that Q-I-N-B-Y or? Uh, sorry, yeah, Q U I M B E E. Okay. Yeah, and so Quimby's great. There, there are other. There's definitely other supplements out there, but but right now that one is the I would say the favorite among my students because they do a really good job of breaking down the cases into incredibly basic basic um, parts, so that you can actually figure out what the case is saying before you invest the time into reading it word for word. Awesome. And I had two questions, but I'll ask one first and then um, see if anyone probably go to the next one, which is um, you kind of sort of going back like, to the uh, exam format. I was going to ask, um, how long is the exam typically? Is it about two or three hours? And then is it just one hypothetical or are there multiple hypotheticals in which you have to address? Good question. So generally speaking, law school exams are three to four hours and they will usually be the amount of hours that is the same as the amount of credit hours. So if the class is a three credit hour class, it's generally a three hour exam. It's a four credit hour class, four credit hour class. It's a four hour exam. And I had some two credit hour classes, two hour, two hour exams. So that's generally how they break it down. The professor gets to decide how he or she wants to structure the exam. Um, and so issue spotters are the most common um, type of exam style that you'll see, especially 1L year, which is the fact pattern and then a very open-ended question, something like discuss all claims and defenses of all parties. And it's up to you to figure out what, what claims, what legal rules are at issue, which is like the issue spotting we talked about. Um, the other type of exam is call a short answer, which is essentially the same as an issue spotter. It's like, I call it an issue spotter short answer, it's like not confuse things, but basically it tells you, the professor tells you what it is he or she wants you to talk about. And so for example, instead of just saying, discuss all claims and defenses of all the parties in the fact pattern, it might say something like, does D have a, does P have a claim for negligence against D? So now, you know, okay, this, this question is specifically asking me to talk about, oops, negligence. Um, the other types of questions you could get, again, the professors have full liberty to do whatever they want, but usually it'll be issue spotter, short answers, multiple choice. Like usually you'll have a, a handful of multiple choice questions, um, which are not any easier, by the way, like they'll just be shorter fact patterns. And then, um, you have to do the same thing, spot the issue, identify the rule. It's just that you don't have to write out the answer, right? The answers are there and you pick one. Um, and then choice policy questions don't show up that often, but they, and they're not that many points usually, but they can be there, which is policy is about why we have the rules that we have. And so they'll give you a hypothetical about like a, a potential statute that Congress made up, but a potential statute that Congress is thinking of adopting. Um, and then you have to analyze the policy behind adopting it or not. That's, a, that's another one. You could also, you know, they could also do true or false. I also do fill in, I've like recently heard one of my students has a fill in the blank. So there are other, there are other pieces, but the, the only thing I would caution you about pieces is that 
if you're talking about short answer, fill in the blank, true, false, or multiple choice, those point totals are set. There is no physical way to get more points than is allocated to those, to those questions. But for an issue spotter or an issue spotter short answer, there is no cap to the amount of, of, of points you can get. Um, and so even if this over here is taking up a portion of the exam, I, I, I caution students to just keep in mind, let's just assume everybody in the class gets all of these right. We still want to maximize the point totals that we're going to get on, on issue spotters, because if this is a wash over here, then the issue spotter becomes the entire cur like basis of the curve. And so like, that's the only thing to kind of, kind of keep in mind um, is that the, the cool thing about issue spotters is that you can accumulate a lot of points and the other, the other types of exams are just, are just set in stone. Um, so yeah, another, <laughs> a little in the weeds on that answer, but like, <laughs> I, I hope that was helpful. No, thank you. That was helpful. Um, and before I'm going to, um, someone asked a question, I was going to just clarify. Um, so, cause I asked, I was asking about a hypothetical. So what you were saying, there are multiple different things from the hypothetical to the fact patterns and a, a multiple choice, which I was like, oh, multiple choice. Like you said, it's not any easier. So that's, <laughs> right. that's funny. Um, so just to clarify. So typically from what I'm so there probably would be just one hypothetical and then the mixture oh. of the, the other things, or could it be more? Or? Yeah. It, so yes, it can be an, it can be anything, but to, I guess to give you like some examples. So, um, for a, for a three hour exam, the professor might do all issue spotters. So he, so he or she might do three fact patterns each an hour long. Um, they might decide to do one long fact pattern issue spotter and, and two short answer and also 15 multiple choice and one policy question. So it can be any combination of those. Um, but I guess what I would say is you, I've never been on a final exam where there's just one like massive five page fact pattern, like with one big question, talk about everything. Um, the, the, the most massive fact pattern I think I ever had was in, was in torts. And I think there were two fact patterns that were like three to five pages each. And, and that was a class. So we'd have an hour and a half on each fact pattern, but that's like the big, that's like the most massive fact pattern I've ever seen like nowadays, I, don't, I would say that professors, um, you, you can probably expect about an hour per fact pattern, uh, 45 minutes, 30 minutes for a short answer. And so they'll, they'll almost certainly be breaking up that time in, into multiple things rather than just like one massive fact pattern. Thank you for that. Appreciate you. Um, one of our future lawyers asked, for those who know that they want to go for a clerkship, how Pervador grades and the ranking up on the school, and what point, excuse me, and at what point should they start scouting for clerkships? Start, start scouting for coaches. Can you ask a follow-up question about maybe what they mean by coaches? But I'll speak to the, the I rest of I meant to say clerkships. I said coaches. Oh, clerkships. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I can read it again. So for, those, so for those who know they want to go for a clerkship, um, how pivotal are the grades and the ranking on, um, on the school? And at what point should they start scouting for clerkships? Perfect. So just to loop everybody in, judicial clerkships are considered very, well, I guess there's this. So judicial clerkships, what they are is you are working for a judge in that judge's chambers, usually for about a year. Some clerkships are two years and there's career clerks, but by and large, you're talking about a one year job. Um, the job of that clerk is to help the judge research and draft opinions. And it's the best job. If you're interested in litigation, it is the best job that you can get out of law school. Um, it gives you, it's like crazy that they let one, like brand new baby lawyers even do this work, but it's tradition. And I assume it's working out okay because they keep doing it. And so, um, yeah, you get like, you get to see behind the scenes, you get to see how a docket is run. You get to, you get to see how judicial opinions are drafted. Like it's crazy. It's really, really fun. Um, there are there are two tiers to judicial clerkships. You can have state clerkships and federal clerkships. Um, both are wonderful. Both will give you amazing experience. Um, but just to make sure that everybody's just aware of this, federal clerkships are considered very prestigious. And so the reason that that is important is because if you get a federal clerkship, whether that's at the district court level, the appellate court level, or of course the U.S. Supreme Court level that can open up doors for you in your career in a way that almost nothing else can. And so 
that's why they're so, so, so competitive. And they're not, there are way more people that want them that apply for them than there are positions just because there's a set of judges in the country um, and it doesn't fluctuate. And so there's, there's no way, there's nowhere for them to create more of these positions. So that's what a judicial clerkship is. That's why it's a really big deal. Um, and then in terms of when to start, oh, you asked about the, the grades. So grades are, are huge. Grades are kind of just like anything in the legal industry. Um, the legal industry is very, very concerned with prestige. And the most it, like important ways that that manifests itself is the ranking of your law school and your class ranking. So if we're talking about uh, like a T14 law school, I don't want, I don't want to, I didn't go to a T14 law school, so I don't want to misrepresent the statistics, but even if you go to a, t a T14 law school, you still want to get as high in your class as you possibly can, because the higher in your class, the more competitive you will be for, for some of these clerkships. Um, and then if you didn't go to a T14 law school, which I did not, you need to get as high in your class. This is very, like I'm saying the same thing over and over, but as high in your class as you possibly can get. Um, because if you kind of, to break this down a little bit more, if you are at a more regional law school, your, your greatest potential for a federal judicial clerkship is going to be in your geographic area. So I went to law school in Dallas, the place where I'm the most competitive for judicial clerkships is in the is in the Dallas division of the Northern District of Texas like the place where you go to law school because the judges are are aware of that law they've heard of the law school they probably know some of the professors they may have even practiced there as attorneys before judges um, and so that pool becomes starts to become very very small of where you are competitive for these for these clerkships and as you can imagine there are multiple people you're a law school applying, there's multiple people from other law schools in the area applying. And we might be talking about like three jobs that these judges are actually giving out. Um, and so the short answer is as high as you can get. Um, if you go to a more, if you go to a, a well-known law school, which I'm just saying T14, but T20, like a well-known law school, you can still be competitive for judicial clerkships outside of your geographic area, just because those schools bring with them brand name recognition. And so to kind of give you an, an idea, so I was a federal judicial clerk in the Dallas division of the Northern District of Texas. There were a ton of judges in the Dallas division, like the, our courthouse was very, very full. And I would say maybe like 15 judges and each judge usually has about two clerks. So you're looking at about 30 clerks per year. And I think there were three of us that were from non-T14 law schools. So even the judges in our in the Dallas division who were getting applications from the law schools in the area still opted to hire a ton of people um, going to name brand law schools outside of the division. Now, I'm not saying that happens all the time, but I, I just want to make sure that everyone is, is aware of like how difficult these things are to get so that to your point, whoever asked this question, awesome that you're thinking about this so far ahead of time. Okay, so grades super important. Um, next thing in your arsenal that will make you the most competitive is getting a judicial internship or externship. Those um, can happen your 1L summer or your 2L spring is usually when those happen. Um, if you are applying for the cycle in law school, meaning it happens during your 2L summer, like June 15th is when is when the application applications open. So that's the second most important thing you can have on your application because it shows that another judge believed in you enough to allow like to allow you into their chambers and you also understand how pace like pacer works like the docket docket system you don't have to start from zero and you have some research and writing experience okay so that's the second most important thing on your application third most important thing i would say is probably um your recommendations and so to your point of like thinking about this really far ahead of time um there are certain professors at every law school that are going to have relationships with judges, either because they know them personally, or they worked with them, or maybe they are expert witnesses. Sometimes like there's going to be somebody. And so what tends to happen is um, there are, there's a lot of competition to get professors, professors to write you recommendation letters, because it will start to become known what professors have relationships with judges, or they'll just straight up tell you, like, I know, <laughs> I know so-and-so judge, and I can like get you an, uh, an interview with them. Um, the reason that that's important is because you need your recommenders to ideally to know you outside of class, like to be able to 
to your work ethic, to be able to speak to your writing and research abilities. And the easiest way to get professors to know that is to become their research assistant. And so most professors will have research assistant positions, um, but those are very competitive. And so most professors, as you can imagine, will usually hire people who got really good grades in their classes. And so that's another reason um, to, to do as well as you can, because that puts you in a, in a great competitive position to ask to be their research assistant, hopefully then to get a letter of recommendation to then be able to apply for a leadership if that's the end game. So all of that is to say, those are, I would say those are the three biggest factors or four if you want to count law school. And then starting, starting as early as possible, creating those relationships with professors, um, going out for research assistant positions, getting those judicial internships is going to, every one of those things is going to bulk up your application more and more. Awesome, thank you. And I said thanks as well for that information. So yeah, we are uh, closing out. Um, I was just gonna ask one last question to kind of uh, uh, just set us out. Um, yeah, I was curious for yourself, what time management skills do you use either now or in law school to help you be successful? And also too as well, um, many of us as future lawyers, what advice can you give us in terms of skills to develop now to start preparing for law school, if at all possible? Ooh, okay. Two, okay, so two really big questions. So the answer to the first one in terms of time management, crazy important like the i would say the defining factor between um people at the top of their class and then people sort of in, in the middle like in the b pack is how you spend your time without a doubt like there is there is too much work there are too many things to do um you cannot physically do them all in a 24-hour period every day and so how you spend your time and how you allocate it and what you allocate it on and when you start and when you stop is like crazy important what I would say is the biggest mistake that I see law students making is not having a semester, a, a semester long view. Um, and so what tends to happen is that, and I was, this is me for semester two is like I said, most of us never really developed like a study strategy per se in undergrad. Um, we kind of just kind of, we winged it and it, you know, and we did what we needed to do when we needed to do it. And if you have like a day to day or a week to week, mentality structure approach, you're going to get buried by the work. You, it, it's just going to happen. And you're not going to be able to carve out enough space for your time at the end of the semester to prepare yourself for finals. And so in terms of time management, what I 100% always recommend is looking at the end game first and then backing yourself out of it. So look at where you want to be by the end of the semester and then set progress points for yourself going backwards in time so that you can really see, oh my gosh, I need to start outlines by this date. I need to finish outlines by this date. I need to take this many practice exams. When is that going to happen? You know, like you, <laughs> these progress points have to be set from day one so that you can stay true to them and you can honor that time that you have reserved for each individual activity um, so that you don't get swept up into this, into this kind of mire of, of reading thousands of pages and then never moving on to another study step. So that would be point one in terms of time management. And, oh, the second thing you asked, oh, thing, steps you can take now to prepare yourself. So I love this question um, because I'm, I'm sort of knee deep in it right now. So, um, I am, I have a, a beta course going right now, the, the zero L project. And it's all about like how, how early can people start preparing for law school? And depending on how much time you have, what can those things look like? So I would break down law school preparation into four categories. I would break it down into substantive legal knowledge. So like actually, actually the things you're going to be learning in law school, law school study strategies, um, practical skills and career development. So those are the four categories that I help law students with and help them prepare and really use that time before law school to be as efficient as, and effective as possible. Um, in terms of what I think personally, okay, two, two things, Depend, it depends on how much time you have. Like, are we talking about six weeks to prepare or like one of my students is gonna is going to apply for the 2022 cycle. So he has a year and a half to prepare for a law school, like it will depend on how much time you have and, and how much time, you know, uh, hours wise, week to week, you want to, you, you want to um, invest. But what I personally would say in, in sort of like the, the traditional time that people start to uh, prepare for law school, which is like the summer before law school strategies, without a doubt, are, are the most important piece because the other things I would say law school strategies, law school study strategies are a need to know. Everything else is a nice to have. So if you have the time, 
and by all means, I would love to, um, to, to dig into practical skills, legal knowledge, and career development for sure. But if we're talking about the task, tax of what you need to know in order to get the most out of your semester and your year, percent law school study strategies. Um, one of the things I guess I will say in terms of like the practical skills. So if we're talking like a lot of time out, not really ready to kind of dig into the, the nuts and bolts of studying, but just kind of interested in like, like soft, soft starts to like what, what we can do. Um, the three practical skills that I think are the most helpful, again, nice to have are, um, your writing skills, your public speaking skills, and your typing skills. So all three of those things are things you can like kind of sort of start to do so, like, like low key on the side um, if you want to. I'm not saying you have to, but for example, if you cannot type at all, like starting to learn how to type is going to be a really big asset for you because that has everything to do with taking notes in class and, and writing final exam answers to maximize points. Um, same thing with public speaking. Like if you know you want to go into litigation and you have time on your hands and you want to take a public speaking course or go through Toastmasters, by all means, you can totally do that. Um, and then in terms of, of writing, writing is tough because it takes a lot longer to to get better at, but there are writing courses out there that you can, you can start to take. And so, yeah, those are, those would be like the three practical skills. I would say they're like a nice to have if you, if you are starting further enough, far enough out and you, ha you have the inclination to improve upon them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, we're out of time. Um, we're going to be having our next session soon, but wanted to say thanks so much to Angela. And one thing I wanted to say, Angela said she didn't go to a T14, but she did graduate uh, summer cum laude, so she knows exactly what the heck she's talking about on um, any of these things. Um, and Angela, I know you have a YouTube channel. Um, while we're um, going off to the next session, could you uh, do you have any information you can drop in the, in the chat in terms of how people can reach out to you? Let us know, or in particular. Yeah. So, um, the, the easiest way, so I'm on, yeah, the, the YouTube channel, Instagram, LinkedIn, are sort of like the common ways to reach out to me. But, um, if you're interested in getting more support or more insight into your law school journey, I run a, uh, a free Facebook group, um, law school network. And so if you go to Facebook, search law school network, that is a community of people who are in law school or prospective law students. Um, and I'm in there all the time answering questions um, and just an amazing supportive group of people. So um, Law School Network is probably the best way to, if you're looking to like dig deeper or like at least start to think about things that you can do to prepare for law school, that's the best way to, to, to do it. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna... Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.